Great. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Terry, and thanks, everyone, for inviting us today. I confess I did not fully anticipate how crazy these last two weeks uh, before the election would be. Uh, with President Biggs focused on running for Congress, much of the responsibility of the president to seek to hold the majority has uh, fallen to me. I spent time in North Carolina and Nevada meeting with national corporations seeking funding to help us try to hold the majority in the Arizona Senate, and it really is at risk. I've also been involved as the de facto chairman of the Senate Victory Fund, working on campaign detail for several key races, in addition to trying to figure out how to hold my own seat in a very uh, unprecedented uh, national election. I'm also unabashed about how important it is for us to reelect Representative Mesnard and Representative Winninger. If I am fortunate enough to be reelected and the Republicans hold the Senate, I do anticipate uh, that I will indeed be elected president of the Senate the day after the election. Uh, we shall see. I thought I would offer just a few items that uh, I think will be front and center in the next session. As always, the budget is what defines the priorities of the state government, and I expect the governor to continue to propose aggressive efforts to uh, implement his desire to diminish business regulation, and that desire will likely take the form of efforts to reduce the number of boards and commissions and to make them more controlled by the chief executive. I think there will still be some low-hanging fruit, but I suspect some of the professions are going to vigorously resist uh, and thereby setting up a real struggle between some of these licensing boards and the governor's office. On the appropriations side, uh, all of the formula-driven amounts are, once that is done, are accounted for, including increase in public school enrollment, DES increases, DCS population increases, HERF funding, and numerous other uh, funds that are on autopilot, the funds available for program increases will be far less than it will be the desire to expand those programs. A notable clash I envision will be between the forces wanting to make kindergarten a fully funded all-day program and those who would like to see the state return to paying a greater portion of the cost to educate a resident student at the state universities. Regardless of how worthy both of those may be, it is difficult to see the revenue rising that much, especially if we remain committed to a structurally balanced budget. I uh, do resist the Governor Napolitano approach of simply making up higher revenue uh, projections so the government could spend more. We absolutely know that that chicken will come home to roost. There's also the idea of keeping the current balance in the rainy day fund, and folks like uh, myself would like to see us commit to reducing the $800 million K-12 budget rollover that remains as one of the gimmicks that we shamelessly used during the Great Recession in an effort to preserve as much K-12 and public safety funding as possible. The governor has regularly indicated his preference to reduce taxes every year, and there is interest in cutting or even eliminating the individual income tax. That presents a serious challenge. A dramatic reduction in individual income taxes will surely be accompanied by an increase in sales or TPT or a consumption tax, and property tax uh, as well would likely increase significantly. And the simple fact of the matter is about the only time we see uh, the government reduce itself in size is when a recession uh, dictates that because of a reduction in revenue. Individual income tax is also the necessary ingredient for the charitable tax credit effort and the great good that it does. And the income tax is also effectively the lifeblood of most of Arizona's remarkably valuable school choice movement. Powerful competing conservative policy goals could be headed for a struggle against one another. There is a potential for a significant reduction uh, in, or a, a 
a reform of how K-12 is funded and hopefully current year funding will finally stop being put off uh, as we move in that direction uh, and district schools become funded more like the way charter schools are funded and hopefully the elimination of district sponsored charter schools designed to get both the greater per pupil money and local property tax refund or funds will now be over once and for all. We look forward to the successful implementation of the A through F school rating system to give parents more information and to reward outstanding performance like we regularly see here in the Chandler Unified School District. As you know, we reformed PSPRS last year and if we can muster the will, it would be good to reform now the Correctional Officers Retirement Plan. As you may recall, we closed the Elected Officials Retirement Plan previously and replaced it with a 401k type plan. One challenge that I would like to see addressed is the so-called... That's where you go to the hospital that is on your insurance plan have a major expensive medical procedure and then discover you owe a large bill because one of the physicians, unbeknown to you, was out of the network. It might be an assistant surgeon or an anesthesiologist, so hello to an unexpected $10,000 bill. Hospitals, doctors, and insurance companies will need to work with us for a solution to this serious problem. There's certainly many other potential issues. I'll simply just quickly list a couple and I'll be done. We're getting to watch Obamacare collapse before our very eyes. The Department of Child Safety has made progress, but it remains a great concern and has become a nearly $1 billion budget item. And uh, that too strains funds for education. And the prison population continues to grow. This is an expensive population to serve, but I don't hear many folks saying, throw open the doors and turn these folks loose on our neighborhoods. In fact, most of us are uneasy about paroled felons, especially sex offenders, if they move in next door. We are also on the path of uh, what I consider an unacceptable attack on law enforcement personnel. If we make law enforcement too difficult, we will all wonder what happened to our quality of life. We also may revisit some of our campaign finance rules as we strive to protect the First Amendment and encourage fairness. And finally, we need to help make certain that the free exercise of religion, which is the very core of why there is a United States of America, is not sacrificed as the judiciary invents more substantive constitutional rights than many of us thought were found within the four corners of our venerable Constitution. That's it. Thank you, Senator. We'll hold questions for after our representative speech. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to introduce uh, Representative Judy Mesnard. Judy Mesnard is the state representative from the Woods Center District 17, Chandler, Gilbert, and Spring Lake. Uh, good morning. If I stand here, is this going to be a problem for the cameras? Okay, I'm not really a stand behind the podium kind of guy. So, um, I'm J.D. Mesnard. I have the honor of representing District 17, this area. This is my uh, third term that I'm in now, and if the voters will have me, I will serve one more bef before being termed out. Senator Yarborough did an excellent job saying most of what I would say. And so um, I'll keep my remarks short, and then I'll, we'll go to uh, the Q&A, and that's usually my favorite part. I want to speak to what I think will be some of the bigger issues this upcoming session. Right now, everybody's focused on the campaign, so it's difficult to anticipate what a lot of the issues are going to be. But uh, here's what I think will be some of the major issues. Uh, K-12 will continue to be uh, an issue that we look at in a couple of different areas in particular. 
Um, we have not uh, funded school construction to the extent we used to in quite some time. And that's made us legally vulnerable to a lawsuit. There was a previous lawsuit back in the day called Students First uh, that led to billions of dollars being spent over a period of time to bring schools up to par and to make sure we were building new schools. When the economy tanked, uh, we switched to essentially a case-by-case -case basis um, and also because the population leveled off, some of the needs uh, re receded a bit. But we're seeing those needs come back. And case in point, in this last legislative session, there was uh, the issue of building schools in a couple of districts, in Chandler in particular. And uh, my seatmates and I fought back against a, a, uh, a move to try to essentially change the formula so that school construction would not be needed in Chandler and Agua Fria. Those are the two districts. And so I, it, assuming that uh, I get elected, I will continue to fight for the funds that the Chandlers deserve. Um, at the end of the day, we need to figure out what the right way is to fund schools. And I don't mean just the in-class uh, per-pupil formula. I mean actually building schools. The truth is, when students first came out, we never solved that problem. We went through several iterations of possible solutions and then essentially threw in the towel and said, here are the keys to the general fund. And we spent about $300 million a year through the better part of 2000 to 2008, 2009. So we need to, re in my view, we need to revisit that. And I think you're starting to hear stories of schools that are struggling in terms of their, uh, their construction and, and their uh, you know, wall cracks or that sort of thing. Those are things we need to take very seriously. So I suspect that one of the major aspects of K-12 that we will look at this next session is school construction. And I can tell you that if I have the honor of being there, that will continue to be a priority for me, as it was uh, for myself and my seatmates this last session. In addition, the governor has had, for about a year and a half now, this Classrooms First initiative. And this Classrooms First initiative is designed to try to make sure resources are getting into the classrooms where we believe they should be. Um, at, at the end of the day, the fundamental function of educators is teaching students. And I will tell you that, um, Speaking for myself personally, we need to be careful that we don't start deviating into other areas that, sure, they, they help students and they're valuable and I don't want to um, minimize their value, but nevertheless, uh, get us away from that core function of teaching students. And we're seeing more and more of the cost of student services, even food service. If you look how one district compares to the next, there's quite a, a range on these various categories of expenses. So what we really need to do is get in and take a look at best practices. And actually, I have to say, Chandler does a phenomenal job. Chandler is looked at by many other districts as a role model, and we have some of the best schools, and I applaud uh, those at the district um, who've helped make that happen. So I think you're gonna see, again, a classrooms a first initiative, as well as school construction be two big things. As, uh, as Senator Yarborough mentioned, uh, this, uh, the K-12, um, well, the K part of K-12, the full day kindergarten has, has revived, um, not in the exact same format from uh, about seven, eight, nine years ago when Napolitano brought it up, uh, but you're, you have some very interesting um, uh, variations of what was a program that was phased out during the economic downturn, and so I think you will see that explored. A lot of that, I suspect, will depend on where the governor's at on that issue, and nobody at this point can say for sure where the governor is at. So I think those three areas will be major focus points uh, for the next session. Tax reform is gonna continue to be a priority for me. Um, as a former chairman of Commerce and serving on the Ways and Means uh, Committee, um, I have worked very hard to try to create a, a tax and regulatory environment that is conducive to job growth. Um, if we want to be creating jobs in this economic, you know, we're actually in an economic boon right now. I don't know if it feels like a boon to you, but <laughs> technically the economy has been churning along um, at a somewhat anemic rate. Actually, we're reaching a point where we, we are at or beyond the average for how long so-called expansions last. And so there is some concern that if we, if we aren't careful with our budgeting, uh, we could re be right back where we were uh, six, seven years ago um, in the Great Recession. Where, where the bottom falls out from underneath of us. Nobody projects that the economy is gonna go down the toilet. I mean, just as a matter of course, I don't remember the last estimate I saw from anybody um, that we base our revenue projections on that said, mm, I think in about two years, things are really gonna go south. Usually it just falls upon you and you have to adapt. And so what we don't wanna do is get right back into the situation where we're making some really tough choices, some reductions in state government, 
uh, because no one wanted to do that. That was not a fun period of time. But we weathered through it. We have a structurally balanced budget now, so that's a huge accomplishment for us, and we just got to make sure that we protect that moving forward. Um, I think that the revenues and the expenditures where they are now is about break even from an ongoing basis. You sometimes hear people talk about the surplus, and we have hundreds of millions of dollars in surplus money. That is true. We have hundreds of millions of dollars in one-time surplus money. And it would be unwise to commit that to ongoing expenditures. Uh, if you got a bonus at the end of the year and you know, a one-time $1,000 bonus and committed yourself to an <coughs> ongoing $500 a month expenditure, like for a new car or something, that would be unwise. In a couple of months, you'd be out of money. Some people want to tap into the rainy day fund. Given, again, where we are with the economic expansion, I think that would be a huge mistake. It's there for actual emergencies. Um, and we got to be very careful how we use it. We made the mistake back in, I think, about 2006, at the height of the last economic expansion, <coughs> of dipping into the rainy day fund in order to spend more. Even though we had a billion dollars in extra spending capacity, that was not enough. And so we actually tapped into the rainy day fund, and then the next year, within a couple of years, is when the economy tanked, and we did not have as much money to help uh, you know, stab off some of these reductions in state government. So as long as I am down there, I'm going to fight against those types of approaches. I think my seatmates and I are, are, are like-minded in that. Um, I think the governor is like-minded in that. I will say this. This is, as Senator Yarbrough mentioned, and I'll end with this. This is an unprecedented election from the very top, mostly, on down. Um, regardless of where you are at um, in, in the various, uh, you know, whether it's the Senate race or the presidential race, there are a lot of races down the ballot. As we and, and my opponents will, will make, make sure you understand, there are other races to get out and vote for. Um, some people are like, ah, what's the point of voting because I don't like either of them? A sentiment I sometimes agree with. But the, 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 the truth is, there are a lot of races down the ballot. You've got 205 and 206 on the ballot. And so this election will have ramifications, not just na nationally, but also for the state of Arizona. And so I just want to end by saying it's been an honor to be your state representative. Um, it, if, I am, if I have the honor of being reelected, I, I will be the Speaker of the House. Uh, so that'll be nice for the district, because the President and the Speaker will be from this district. Um, but of course, that's up to the voters. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's uh, great to be back here. Uh, as Stephanie said, I w uh, was a Chandler City Council member, and I think uh, going to my comments, which they covered a lot of the very big issues, I'll probably dial down a little bit into some more micro issues that I feel is important. Because as a Chandler City Council member, you understand how important economic development is, especially in this city and what it's done. Uh, to help grow our city, to help make uh, our schools strong because there's the property tax base and all those bases of sales tax and the things that go into helping uh, build this uh, great city. So a lot of that deals with technology, the Price Corridor around the airport and Chandler's done very well with that and I think the state government is starting to adapt. Although we're adapting very slow, I see us adapting to the new businesses, to the new economy coming uh, up. And there's some real strange bedfellows on these issues because uh, there's entrenched bureaucracies, entrenched interests who are pushing back on these things. Think of Uber. So Uber, you're dealing with the taxicab unions and you're dealing with people who've had uh, this business model for years and years. And they're coming in and it's called disruption. They are literally disrupting these, uh, these businesses, these technologies. And there's been a lot of pushback. This is one thing I think where uh, conservatives I think are missing the boat <coughs> somewhat is that with these entrenched bureaucracies I mean if you look in New York where you had uh, you know 
Bloomberg and these people pushing back against these things. The millennials love these things. Uh, so we're not doing a good enough job communicating with the millennials, but we're also not doing quite a good enough job adapting. The last two years with Governor Ducey, he's very big on the sharing economy, and he's really led on these kinds of issues, whether it be Uber, uh, Airbnb this last year, which we uh, passed, which you know allows you to rent out a room in your home and make some extra money. It's your room. It's your house. Um, I would even throw the beer bill into this um, into this technology. You, you basically you have these very old laws uh, that are bumping up against laws today. So laws from Prohibition era, saying you know you have this three tier system, but it was hampering our local businesses. Uh, Santan Brewery, Anthony. Santan Brewery, which now that Four Peaks has sold to Anheuser Busch, makes Santan Brewery, our hometown guys, the uh, largest independent beer producer in Arizona. That's pretty exciting for Chandler. But because of that bill, because the governor pushing that, and because all of us getting on board, is why they have that freedom now. Um, and there's so many different ways, and we need to tap into the, the ingenuity of people uh, down there in the private sector and education to see how far these bills uh, and these technologies can go. I mean, if you think about how insanely expensive it is for Medicaid transports, and this is something I brought up to the governor's office last year, is starting to have some kind of RFPs or, or at least looking at the idea of some of these, if it's not an emergency, but of Medicaid reimbursement for some of these transports, whether it be Uber or Lyft. Just dealing with DCS, one thing Greg McKay found in transportation was he found the way a contract was written with a purveyor that there was uh, transportation companies, basically some cab companies who were picking up, say, a foster mom and two kids, and they are transporting them for a visit with the uh, birth mom, which they should do. They're trying to re reunify them. But these transportation companies were charging full freight for three people or four people, and bilk, bilking the state up to $5 million a year because of this. Now, when he pushed back against that, he got huge pushback. He was getting calls from legislators from both parties who were supporting that transportation company. Uh, I didn't get any names, but both parties were involved. Again, you have these entrenched interests who have this gravy train going, who are wasting taxpayer dollars. And what you have to remember when people get upset when you push back about these things. These are dollars. If they're not spent there, they're being spent somewhere else. When we had the Great Recession in Chandler when I was a councilman, we were bold. I mean, I'm not trying to show off, but we were bold. You had Phoenix and other people who were, you know, eh, we're going to do some furloughs. So we're going to take, we're going to take this, and we're just going to hit a pause button to where we get out of the recession, and then we're going to go back to the exact same practices that we were doing two years, two years later and just suck up any new revenue we get instead of making hard choices at that time. Uh, I think Rahm Emanuel, he has the famous phrase of uh, never let a good crisis go to waste or all that. Well, I mean, we use that as an opportunity. We said, hopefully there's no synchronized swimming fans in here. I mean, I can be a fan, but, you know, we said, is synchronized swimming lessons at, at the city of Chandler a necessity? You know, or is that a way we could save money? In the end, uh, we reduced our staff, I think, by 12 to 15 percent. Nobody was fired. It was voluntary. Uh, you know, they were voluntarily left. They got early retirement, and we shrunk our force. And I think to this day, it stayed very, very lean, which is why Chandler's tied with Gilbert for uh, the least amount of employees per thousand and the lowest cost uh, of service to its citizen per thousand. Um, so just basically economic development, how we can get more economic development, how we can get more dollars, whether it be angel investors and different things in this region. I mean, we have great companies that can be born here. Uh, Infusionsoft is one of them. You know, we have eBay, PayPal here. How do we get more money to those entrepreneurs? Uh, one thing I did, which uh, my bill, which was the crowdfunding, which legalized that, which there's a, there's a couple companies that there's a brewery that's launching with that. There is a, uh, one of these mattress companies like Tuft & Needle, that kind of thing, that is launching with crowdfunding and more innovative ideas of how we can loosen up the money like that. But then we have to deal with regulation in all aspects. Regulation, as business people, I'm sure a lot of you know, is just choking 
our business community, um, whether it be minimum wage coming up, whether it be Obamacare, whether it be just an edict from on high in D.C. saying that you're going to pay overtime to any employee who makes less than $47,000. Well, basically, I, I have probably six or seven managers at Floridinos, all make between 40 and with bonuses, $80,000 a year. Anytime we've been more successful, we've passed that money on to them, a share of it to them. Uh, but basically, the government is coming in and saying, well, we know you pay this manager $45,000 a year for 48 hours a week, which, if anybody's ever worked in the restaurant industry, is generous. 48 hours a week is low for restaurant standards. And, but they're coming in and saying, no, not anymore. With a stroke of a pen, you now pay your manager $45,000 for 40 hours a week, and you're going to pay them overtime. I just, I, I don't understand people coming in from the outside who don't understand the industry and, and think that it's, you're just going to tell people how they're going to do things. If you did that with any other industry, go to Hollywood and, and walk on a set and say, you know, yeah, and Hollywood, you know, not ne necessarily the, uh, well, they're hypocrites. I mean, it's the same people who say, I'd be happy to pay more taxes, but everywhere they go film is where the states have very, very low taxes and big tax breaks for, for the filming industry. But if you went there and you went on a set and you said, you know, uh, your first assistant director makes $80,000 a year. We think that they should make one hundred and twenty, dollars And your gaffer makes $40,000 a year. They should make ninety. dollars You would have a revolt from Hollywood because they don't want people coming in there and telling them how to do the business. You'd also have, uh, you'd have ticket prices just skyrocket a lot less people would go and the industry would radically change and a lot of people would lose jobs. But somehow when you apply it to other jobs, whether it be restaurants or anything else, magically that's not going to happen. Um, one of my pet peeves if you haven't uh, <laughs> figured that out by now. A um, couple of things that I ran last year and things that I uh, might run this year. Last year I ran a, uh, tried to get a teacher tax credit. And I always preface this by saying teachers should not have to pay for supplies for their own classroom, but they do. And I think even with the $3.5 billion coming into education here in the future, they're still going to. And I think hopefully when we're successful getting more money into K-12, they're still going to. And I don't think they should have to. I think if they do, they should be reimbursed for that money in a tax credit, not a deduction, a dollar for dollar credit. Um, I got it out of the house uh, with bipartisan support, and it didn't get anywhere in the Senate. So I'm hoping, and we're going to run that again this year. Um, little things, and this, this is just a little thing, and I might have mothers against drunk drivers or somebody come up against this, but the serving age in, if anybody ever worked in a restaurant? Okay. Serving age in Arizona, for you to take a beer and put it on a table, is 19. It's an insanely arbitrary number. I mean, I guess I could understand 21, but why 19? So I'm going to run a bill to try to make that 18. My son busses tables. He can take a beer away, a half full beer. To me, there's a lot better chance he's going to take a drink of that back by the bus stop. He won't. He doesn't. But then somebody with a full beer going to a table, here you go, taking a sip. So to me, you get into college. And this is when you need to be making money as a working person. And, for, you know, I waited tables my first year in college, and that's a, a good time to make a good amount of money in a short amount of time let you get home and do your homework. So it's a little thing, but that's uh, one bill I'll be uh, running this year. I think J.D. mentioned, uh, or uh, Senator Yarborough mentioned, talking about police and that. Uh, there's different mitigating factors. We don't have a hate crime legislation, but there is mitigating factors for crimes against certain people, uh, uh, whether it be, uh, I believe, uh, minorities and that. And I think the mitigating factors should be equal. So I'm looking at that, whether if you attack a first responder, police officer, firefighter, those should be on the same level. Um, so looking at that as well, other than that, uh, I guess we can get on to Q&A. Thank you very much.
Is this for me, I hope? Okay. Um, the answer is no. If this passes, it will be the law of this state. And more importantly, it will be something that we, the legislature, can do very little about. Anything that passes at the ballot is voter protected. That means that in this state, um, what, you, what we do on the ballot is that much more important. I don't know of any other state that has this. If you pass it at the ballot, it's locked in stone, but we do which means essentially if it's a disaster, if our economy is impacted, uh, if folks are losing their jobs, which are all reasons why uh, I oppose it and I think we all do here, um, as well intended as it might be, the consequences will be that people will lose jobs, their prices will go up, and obviously uh, Mr. Uh, Winnegar can speak to that. But um, it, yeah, it does not make exceptions. Most minimum wages in the past have made exceptions. This one does not. Um, and so it will price people out of the market, uh, younger people, folks who have, have uh, certain challenges, and it will be, not only will it impact our economy, it will impact their lives personally. Um, the only way to change anything that passes at the ballot will be to go back to the ballot, which we can only do every two years. We can't even do it in the, min in the middle. With statutory changes, you can only do it on a November general election. So, um, you know, I oppose it for that reason um, and uh, encourage you to get the word out because it's one of those things that at first, I'm, yeah, we should, we should pay people more. But I, heck, I went, to a, um, I went to a center for uh, folks who, I forget the name of it, but they work with those who have disabilities and they are, have, they are freaking out that this is going to pass because they don't know how they're going to be able to afford um, to hire people to come in and deal with this special pop population. So. The answer is, unfortunately, no. So please tell your friends to vote no. I'll follow up on that. Uh, this, and I'm really sorry about that situation. And unfortunately, everything he said is true. Pivoting to the marijuana one, um, Colorado right now is having a lot of, they're having a lot of problems with kids eating the gummies, the, the, the marijuana gummies. So think about this, how it locked in this is. The way it's written, whether it be the DUI uh, scenario or the gummies, you're going to have to wait two years. If kids are dying or getting sick and because they're eating these gummies, you have to wait two years before you can change that. Um, and, and that's if you can get it through then. Um, that's the, the problem with sometimes the way these things are written. There's the top headline, you know, just like when you read the news, the 10 second sound bite sometimes sounds good, but the details when you get into it aren't so friendly and can have disastrous effects. Well, um, it is a constitutional right of the people of this state to offer initiatives um, in the form of statutory or constitutional changes. Any change we make to that will have to be passed by the people of this state. The challenge is when you make it, by all appearances, more difficult, everyone attacks you for being 
anti-voter or anti-democracy. Um, I introduced something that was intended to sort of try to strike a balance between the Voter Protection Act that we have now and sort of a different one moving forward. And I just got ridiculed across the media because clearly I uh, don't trust the voters or want to override the voters or whatever. That wasn't the intent at all. The intent was situations just like this. Um, I, I don't know what the solution is. I don't know how you overcome uh, short of having conversations with a lot of people that explain the ramifications of these sorts of things where out-of-state interests are coming in. The marijuana industry will make millions of dollars and they're running ads saying, do it for the kids. <laughs> Seriously, that's what they're saying. Do it for the kids, because the money, some of it, at least is going to go into the classroom. Never mind the money that's going into their pockets. I find that so offensive, and the fact that it's coming from out of state makes it just salt in the wound. Honestly, Shirley, I don't, I don't know what the solution is that will be sellable in a 10-second soundbite. Because again, it comes, out, it comes across as anti-democracy, anti-voter. The legislature, no, no legislative entity of any party that's in control is ever popular. So if something comes from us, they look at it through a certain amount of skepticism. I, I will continue to look at that. I'm sure we all will. At the end of the day, it will be the voters that have to change this constitution, um, and we will have to overcome what I, will be, what I believe will be a built-in bias to protect that, including from those out-of-state interests who can also fund opposition to any effort to do that on the ballot moving. Question, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. The question was, um, why can't we uh, just pass a bill to fix the uh, pension for police for public safety, uh, PSPRS essentially? Why can't we just do that? And, and to answer your question, we, yeah, uh, we obviously, with what was on the ballot, we, we made some real progress, but that actually only impacts new hires among first responders. The problem is we have a constitutional provision that basically protects the interests of a person who has been in the system. And when we ran my previous legislation successfully that did more of what you've just indicated, Joel, uh, the court struck down a substantial portion of that legislation. And so uh, that's the challenge, is that people have a vested interest in those, in those pensions, understandably. I mean, I have two sons who are police officers, so this is always a fun topic around Thanksgiving dinner, as you can imagine. <laughs> uh, so we're, we're in a, a, a situation where it's simply what the Constitution provides about uh, no, no reduction uh, can, can be enacted relative to those interests. And so that's why we decided in our second run at public safety pension reform to basically just go with new hires. It will take many years for that to work all the way through the system and become effective, but at least we were able to do that. And uh, hopefully I, that will be helpful. I would add to that, um, yeah, you have to be careful. You've made promises to people and you have to be careful where you make the changes, but your local police departments and fire, uh, fire departments need to make some of the changes. So when we're on city council, when I was on city council, and I hate, I know I say that a lot, but one of the changes we made um, was police officers were getting overtime, and they still do, extra duty, but they, that was counting into the retirement. So if they were directing traffic at Cornerstone on a, on a Sunday, and you saw a lot of people that went way up in their last three years of service, that counted into retirement, and it just, it really skyrocketed these retirements. I mean, you've seen Phoenix with their city managers and stuff and how, how bad this has gotten. And so each city needs to look in and they need to have pressure to look at those policies because those internal rules uh, in the city charters and stuff are exasperating this problem a lot.
hold and the First Amendment Nation to step in and, and halt, halt those and has been successful at this point, but there's going to need to be some legislative uh, cleanup, um, that backfilling to make sure that that isn't uh, coming down. Is that something that's on your radar screen? And, and what do you think is Definitely. Uh, I've heard people talking about already, other legislators, how you know, you're going to have to ha give them a cure period and, and legislation like that. I'm 100 percent in support of that. The, I mean, this is just basically ambulance chasers just trying to uh, make a buck. And unfortunately, I mean, some of these signals come from on high, from the federal government. I mean, you go to different cities and municipalities and just look at the sidewalks. Anytime they do any construction within its own area, they have to spend tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars you, putting in you. instead of the, you know, the lines. And I'm not an expert at it, but it used to be the lines for the, you know, for the blind and stuff. And now it's for the vision impaired. Now it's the dots. And so, I mean, think about little towns, you know, have to go and change that. And then it's the, you know, you got to change the pool drain of these little towns in every hotel. And so uh, a lot of times these things are, I think, get signals from above like that because it's been going on in government for a long time. They can start at the, the guys who are actually doing the complaints, because I saw that news piece where their signs were all messed up and everything. Yeah. They didn't want to talk <laughs> yeah. yeah, and let me add to um, my understanding is that the folks doing this came from California. California mm -hmm. made some reforms. Now they're moving elsewhere. I'm sure they'll continue out east uh, as, as states uh, catch up. But I will say this, too. This is the challenge when you create a lot of of regulations, <coughs> even as well intended as they might be, every single one you create, just be aware, creates an opportunity for a lawsuit. Every single one. And so certainly we can, as, as Jeff was indicating, the cure period is what I'm hearing is the overarching uh, uh, remedy. Um, but, but every regulation you create uh, is an opportunity for someone to break a law, uh, or whether it's criminal or civil. And uh, so that's why I resist um, you know, this, this onslaught of more and more regulations. Even if each of them by themselves seem like a great idea, it's gonna help this or cause this to happen that we want, you add them all up and you get a serious regulatory burden on folks. And I'll just wanna add real quick, I've had these discussions with the Attorney General as well, and his efforts to force these plaintiffs into a class action, and normally most of us are going running like crazy away <laughs> from class action, but this is actually where we're trying to use the class action procedure in an effort to put all these people in the same, uh, same tub, so to speak, so that perhaps we can drown them simultaneously. Um, disability funding. Uh, last year you raised disability by a percentage point. It's been, it was cut drastically during the recession. Um, so, that's the first question. Will there be an increase in disability funding knowing that you pay, the state pays 72 cents on the dollar of what it costs to take care of someone with disability? And then off of Jeff's um, question on Prop 206, um, those, those people that are employed at Fry's are probably working through one of these disability providers that has to follow those rules so then they're not able to even pay for um, these people to be out there, which means they end up back on the state. Would there be some kind of emergency funding if 206 passes on some of those disability mm -hmm. providers that would literally be going out of business? Knowing that those disability providers, when they go out of business, the state can't do what they do for as cheaply as they do. Yeah. On my place, it's up to you guys. Okay. Uh, I'm always re careful to try to predict 
what will happen in a budget down the road, but you do make a compelling point. Some of us, all of us here, I think, uh, supported the efforts to increase the payment for the disability services, but I think you make an extra good point, and it, it's in my mind, and we'll see where it can go. The uh, Arizona Republic reported that uh, the average funding for nationalists per student uh, per student is eleven thousand dollars. Arizona's is seventy five hundred. Passed Proposition one hundred twenty three, then had to settle for less, with the expectation that there'd be some sort of follow up in terms of funding for, for education. What are you gonna do? All right, I'm just gonna talk. Where'd the mic go? Do you lose the mic? It's picking up. Okay. Oh. Um, this gets back a little bit to what I, I indicated earlier. Um, when you add up all funding sources in Arizona and Fed and all, all the way down, it's about nine thousand um, dollars. We are below the national average. Um, so, yeah, below. And so, um, I think in the in, in the next session, as I indicated before, there are certain areas I'm I'm seeing uh, that all of which will involve more money to K-12, whether it's uh, get, you know reexamining the school construction uh, strategy, uh, whether it's K uh, funding, uh, full day kindergarten funding, um, or or classrooms, um, the classrooms first initiative. I, I will just tell you candidly, I want more resources in the classroom. That's that's my priority. I think we talk about this uh, regularly that. I will never look at throwing money at anything, as, as awesome as it might be as, a, as an area of our government that we should prioritize as the solution. Um, the resistance you get sometimes to additional funding is that you have disparate districts, especially let's look at a DSEG district that gets $2,000 more per kid. You would expect if money is the solution to the problem by itself, they would be doing really, really well, and they're not. So the challenge is that if, if the argument continues to be more resources, period, without reforms, without making sure it's getting to the classroom, getting to teachers, I ran a bill in my first two years to try to set a minimum for how much of the K-12 money was getting to uh, instructional staff salaries. You know who opposed it? The AEA. They opposed it. So I, I, I sometimes find myself wondering wh wh what really are our priorities? If it's just more money to a system um, without reforms, you're going to get resistance to that. Because no matter whether it's education, healthcare, public safety, you should always make sure resources are being used. They're taxpayer dollars. They must be used wisely. And I think you will see in this next session, as I indicated, more resources being dedicated to K-12, and they will be accompanied with reforms. But some of those reforms are being developed, so it's too early to say what they, what they are. Um, but like Senator Yarbrough said, it's sort of difficult to you know, predict crystal ball what, what's going to happen. Um, K-12, you know, we get brought up a lot as being low relative to other states in terms of K-12 spending. We are one of the highest in terms of our budget. In terms of how much of our budget goes to K-12, there are few other states that have made K-12 a greater priority relative to their budget than Arizona. But we don't talk about that as much because it's all about dollars. Um, I support more money to K-12. I do. But I support it with reforms. And so as long as I'm down there, it's going to be those two together, not just the one. So um, both good questions. So the, the economy can be moving along in a slightly upward tra trajectory. That's what I mean by an anemic growth. So it's not going negative. Um, normally, recessions, I think, are defined as two negative quarters in a row. Um, we haven't seen that. Um, we haven't even seen a negative one in quite some time. But the upward uh, growth is extremely small. That's what I mean by anemic. Usually when you come out of a recession, you'll see a huge boom. We had a recession back in 2002, 3, and 4, followed by this huge growth in the economy, 4, 5, 6, 7, before the, it, the downturn. Um, and unfortunately, after that, ever since, it's been very, very slow. It's been growing, 
but it's been very uh, slow at its growth. That's what I mean by anemic growth. Um, and the other question as far as the rainy day fund, I actually ran legislation to try to define when we would tip in, uh, tap into the rainy day fund. It's a great question. When, we sh when, sh when is it raining? Yeah. Whose who's definition of raining, right? And to tap into the rainy day fund. I would say when we're back into the negative uh, growth, that then it's at least rain, what, raining. Whether or not it's pouring and how much you wanna tap into is of course a discussion for that time. But so long as we are growing, even if we're growing small, uh, small amounts each quarter, we are at least moving in the right direction. If we, at the times when we are growing, tap into the rainy day fund, then when actually we go negative um, in the economy, we have a recession, especially of the magnitude we had uh, a few years ago, several years ago, uh, then we're in a bigger world of hurt than we already are. So my, my answer, in short, is when we have negative economic growth. And if I might just add to that, some of us believe that perhaps in the rainy day fund is actually not sufficient and we ought to be adding to it or as I've indicated before, at least eliminating the $800 million carryover that's left over a gimmick that we used in the K-12 rollover. Uh, we, we, need, we need to pay that back. We need to have that table clean and then go forward from there. So. Uh, we're, we're far away, in my opinion, from being in a position that we should be tapping that rainy day fund. It needs to be going the other direction, up. Well, Bing's, you bring up clean elections. Um, <laughs> so I, that's, that's the end of the case. But that's, okay, that's repeat it. I'll, I'll answer the first part, and then I'll yeah. hit clean elections. What was the first part again? First part is, how is that any different than people who take outside money to help run their political campaigns? It's not necessarily different. And, so and I, I don't find either of them noble, but I believe in freedom of speech. Um, and I believe just like the Supreme Court decision that the money equals speech. On the clean elections thing, one thing that has been troublesome this year, and, and I know there's this caveat that it's just, it's clean. <laughs> Again, yeah. we're back to the bold headline and the 10-second uh, the sound soundbite, but that it's, it's clean money, it's pure, it's taxpayer money. I mean, whether it's from penalties or whatever, it's coming from taxpayers. And we've seen something that's been kind of troubling to me, I don't know about to the other guys this year, where we have candidates who are running clean, taking that money that was provided by citizens and giving it to partisan parties. The clean elections candidates for corporation commission, last I checked, wrote uh, $25,000 checks to the Democrat party. That doesn't seem like clean elections to me. That seems like electioneering and taking taxpayer money and using it for partisan purposes. And I object to that. I, there's no such thing as clean. Um, money is money, whether it's coming, it's a $5 donation that, that somebody gives you that then triggers public money. Um, I've seen lots of interest groups go out and get the $5 contributions for the person they support. How is that any different? There, the truth is, in my, in my observation, um, one thing that clean elections has done um, is, is create people who are unaccountable to just about anybody because they're just handed a lump sum of money and, and they will run on a message of, see, I'm unbeholden to special interests. Well, that sounds really good. But what it also means is you're not beholden to anybody. When you actually have to go to folks and ask them to open their wallets and pull out their hard-earned money, Okay, that takes something different than when someone hands you uh, your campaign war chest and you can go do what you want. It has, since its passage, driven both parties to the extremes because they don't have to moderate. They don't have to appeal to the folks who would open up their wallets and give them money. For the most part, they can get 200 folks to give them five bucks in the case of the legislative race, and then here's their, their money. So I know it sounds good, but 
There is no such thing as clean elections. You'll have special interests helping you get your clean elections funding or give you money. It's the same either way. Now, you say they're not accountable to anybody. They are, to the voter. And, and why, what should, this is accountable to a voter that a campaign donate. Well, then, uh, then what you're saying is the reverse of what you said earlier, which is that we're all accountable to the folks who put us into office and those who, who contribute to us. So at the end of the day, you know, we're all accountable. My question was out of state money. Not, you're not accountable to out of state money. You're not accounting to those people. You're accountable to the people in Arizona or District 17. And if you have out of state people funding your campaigns, what is the difference for those out of state people there trying to get those initiatives passed? It's still money. Why complain about one and not the other? Okay. Especially you, Jamie. Because you, you win. Well, I just want to redirect this. We want to keep this so it's not adversarial. This is an oh, informational meeting. This is an informational meeting, so what I'd like to do is because we've got still a lot of things to discuss on our agenda, and um, I want to thank all three of you for being here today. Um, let's give them a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.